Okay, everyone. My name's Dr. Owen Cameron. I work at the Australian Public Service Commission, and I look after a program called the Capability Review Program. There's a lot of discussion on what we should do in terms of improving capability in organisations. It's nice, actually, to have an opportunity to talk to you about something that's happening. In terms of where this all came from, some of you may be familiar with the blueprint for reform ahead of the game, which was released in 2010. That was a roadmap for improving public administration in Australia. One of the recommendations in that blueprint was recommendation 8.1, which was to conduct agency capability reviews. Specifically, that the Australian Public Service Commission, the APSC where I work, will implement a program of periodic reviews of agencies' institutional capabilities. The overarching objective here is to try and improve the leadership strategy and deliver, delivery capability across the public service as a whole. In terms of why this is so important, you've probably heard a few of these themes already today, but I think it's worth reiterating them. We've got a real imperative for improving capability. On a very basic level, and just to make sure that this isn't about public service in isolation, when you look forward, all organisations can improve. Everybody's facing changing circumstances. It's what any organisation has to do. We've got very rapid changes in the landscape for public administration. We're sealing social, environmental and ethical issues spreading across the nation and increasingly being international. We've got increased imperatives for efficiency and effective service delivery. We've got rapid evolution of technology, both in terms of the speed of delivery and the number of channels that it's going through. And we've got a workforce that expects more flexible conditions at the moment, the leadership in the Australian Public Service is taking action to have the capability it needs for the future. You may not be aware of that, but it's actually happening. I also wanted to make clear that we recognise that the Public Service does have centres of excellence and some exceptionally committed staff. If you just read the press, you might struggle to believe that message, but it, it is very true. And in essence, where we are is agencies are working together right now to raise capability both in individual departments and across the service as a whole. How we're doing that is this programme called the Capability Reviews Programme. We're using a methodology that's been taken overseas in the UK, Canada, New Zealand and several multilateral forums. It's been proven to work. Following a consideration of the methodology, the Australian Government decided in 2011 to introduce a programme of reviews for all 20 major portfolio departments and three major agencies, Australian Customs and Border Protection Service, the Australian Taxation Office, and the Australian Bureau of Statistics. What that means is we're doing 23 individual reviews that are looking at how to improve capability in each of these major agencies of state. We're also using this program of reviews to think about the service as a whole. Where are their common themes? Where are their common gaps? And to really identify systemic issues and again, if you weren't aware, we're actually halfway through the programme now. We've established or have 19 of the 23 reviews ongoing, and I've only got four left to get set up. They'll all be completed by mid-2014. So we're talking about capability reviews. What the heck does that mean? It's a wonderful area for jargon. What I really want to emphasise for you is this is about organisational capability. We're looking at how to improve capability in the organisation as a whole. That's done through thinking about expertise, the people you have, and capacity, the processes and the systems that enable your people to work well. In essence, we're thinking of organisational capability as the sum of the expertise of an organisation's people and the capacity of the organisation itself to apply this expertise. You're integrating all three elements. It's not a workforce capability review where you may look at work standards and roles and responsibilities. It's this whole of organisation beast. So again, this is my favourite slide. I'm a great believer in telling people what something isn't to help them figure out what it is. What is a capability review? It focuses on an agency's capability to deliver against emerging challenges and future objectives. It's looking over the horizon. It provides a big picture assessment of how people, processes and systems integrate to enable good policy outcomes, good service delivery outcomes. It is an agency-wide perspective at the whole of organisational level. We're not looking at specific projects or functions. They're considered, but you're taking this shot across the agency as a whole. What a capability review isn't is an audit of previous performance, 
an evaluation of current or past program outcomes, an efficiency review, a re-review of previous reviews and their recommendations, which is always how I can tell if I'm really awake if I get through that bullet point. And lastly, it is most definitely not an evaluation of the appropriateness of policy advice per se. Your policy capability would be one element of organisational capability you would consider. How do we do it? Well, I told you it was a common methodology. We actually take this wheel, this framework, and we take it into every single agency. If you think back to what I said about the blueprint, we have leadership, strategy, and delivery. Those are the three core components, going back to what are considered the three most important elements of public administration. Under each of those, we have sub-elements, and under each sub-element, we have a series of guidance questions and topics that will be considered. I'll go back to this a little bit later, but this is a standard methodology. It was adopted from the UK, it's been used overseas, and it gives us a consistent framework to apply across agencies. Uh, the great word in government process. How do we do it? Well, in essence, there's quite a long engagement phase. In optimal circumstances, that would be about five months uh, getting everything ready. It runs in parallel across the programme. Recently, it's been closer to five weeks. Uh, we actually have a review phase, which is typically between 11 to 16 weeks. That's results in, a, in an actual report, a written report that is made public. Uh, they're all released in a tranche once a year in November with the State of the Service report. So there is transparency here. Everyone is aware that the findings will be public. Following on from the report, an agency comes up with a plan that it will lead in terms of how it will improve capability. And we have ongoing reporting and monitoring. Key elements for you are that the reviews are designed and delivered in partnership with the agencies. This is not a management consultancy exercise. We're doing this with agencies. It's a consultative iterative process that involves document analysis, interviews and workshops, going back to flesh out hypotheses and then test them. The review itself is actually independent. It's led by three eminent senior reviewers. One is typically an ex-secretary of an agency. One is typically the CEO or equivalent of a private sector company. And the third is typically a sitting band three within the service. What that's doing is giving you somebody who understands where the systems come from, somebody who's within the system, and somebody who's independent. And together they can bring fresh perspectives into the agency. They own the report. It's their report. The senior review team is supported by dedicated teams I run from the Public Service Commission and from a support staff within the agency. And as I've noted, the findings of the review report, the independent findings, are used by the agency to implement practical measures to improve capability. And I really want to emphasise one word here. Practical. If it doesn't get to the point of something that can actually be done, we haven't done our job. And the whole purpose of the reporting and monitoring phase is to validate that there has been capability improvement. To make this work, my teams have a particular approach that dominates the whole programme. We recognise we're working within the service, with the service, to improve the service. People are giving up time to get these reviews completed. That means we go in with a partnership approach. We're accountable. We have to have openness. We have to be very respectful, show integrity, and show leadership on site and agencies. We're not going in there to tell everyone they're useless and it should be done better right now. We're helping them look at where they'll need to be in 12, 18 months, three years, five years, and what capability they're going to need to develop. You just think of the changing ICT environment. In terms of how the review itself is undertaken, it's about impact, not activities. We've got plenty of processes. Are they going anywhere? We're trying to add practical value. Again, that comes back to having clear findings that agencies can run with. On the whole of service level, it comes to moving ideas across agencies. That's my particular responsibility, my point of differentiation, so to speak. We don't want agencies all spending money doing the same thing to address the same problem. If somebody's got a solution, move it. We use evidence-based assertions. I've said it's an iterative methodology. It's a mixture of quantitative and qualitative approaches, but we have to have evidence for our recommendations. It goes public, it's open to challenge, and agencies need to know there's a firm evidence for what they're doing. We must maintain confidences. It's an open review, but we're asking people to talk frankly about an agency. So again, open process, but we respect where information came from. And we must deliver value for money. I run a fee-for-service program. It's public funds paying for the commission. It's public funds paying for the agencies. And it's agency budgets paying for our work. So we benchmark ourselves against external consultancies and make sure we're significantly cheaper. If we had half an hour, we don't. Just wanted to show you there are three phases, pre-field work, field work, and post-field work. 
I've said to you there's document collation, there's quite a lot of interviews and workshops, there's constant meetings with the secretary of the agency. It's a very intense process and when the senior review team's on the ground, we want to have them working with the agency executive as fastly and as efficiently as possible because it all costs money. Going back now to what we look for, if I take leadership first for you, I just wanted to give you a sense of the kind of themes that people are looking at within an organisation. What capability are they looking to see in terms of where it is now and where it could move to? They're looking at the extent leadership is setting direction for and culture within an organisation. They're looking at how clear is line of sight. Can people with the bricks, and Ian may have said this already, it's one of his favourite ones, see the cathedral? I like to think of it as really simply line of sight. Do you have a sense that the work you do integrates with the strategic objectives of the department? Do stakeholders get a sense of what the strategic objectives of the department are in terms of what they see? And is this process supported by strategic planning? Motivating people, developing people, there's a distinction between having motivated staff and staff that are being motivated, and that's quite an important one. Developing people, well, if you've got clear capability needs for the future, are you preparing your workforce now to get them there? And undercutting that, do we have effective learning and development? And is the performance management framework clear, being used and understood? So those are the kind of things they look at under leadership. Strategy. We may have a strategic intent statement, but does anybody understand it? Does it correlate through your operational plan? Does it make sense given what people think the department's going to do? Do you have clear, achievable targets that you're trying to deliver to, for policy responses? Is your strategic policy outcome focused? Does it actually deliver something? And do you have evidence to support it? As I said, is it understood by your stakeholders? Do performance metrics and evidence-based targets feed back into how you're assessing your strategy? And whenever you're designing the strategy for the organisation, do you actually collaborate with stakeholders, with customers, with other agencies? All of those factors are taking us just beyond do you have a strategy to is your strategy live within the organisation to does your strategy actually make sense to the people ultimately you need to deliver it with. Delivery. Kind of important in government, service delivery. Is your delivery citizen focused and citizen centric? We have innovative delivery, prime resource and prioritise, share commitment and sign delivery models and manage performance. Manage performance here is organisational performance, not individual performance. But ultimately under sitting all of these is, are you mobilising resources through the right channels and systems to get the right services to the right people so that they see the service in the manner they would expect from government? Are you engaging and collaborating with delivery partners to have a coherent approach? Are you coordinating with other government agencies? And as I've said, are you actually measuring effectively whether or not your organisation is performing well? And is that being supported by a risk management framework where you manage risks rather than just identify and classify them? These are all the things the senior review teams go in, interview the staff, interview the executive, and use as the basis for their final report. So this is quite a heavy snapshot across an organisation. Just a few tasters for you. These are very high level. As the programme goes forward, I start to get a body of evidence. Some of it is recurring themes, although those themes may play out differently in different organisations. In some instances, we're seeing issues across agencies, and you can almost see how if you took part A from agency A and part B from agency B and put them together, you'd have a working system. This is the real extra value of looking across the reviews. Strengths of the service, high levels of staff commitment to public service. I'll be frank, yeah, boy, you need that at the moment. Uh, it's really important to recognise that staff want, a lot of them want to deliver public good. The APS has strengths in articulating the government's policy agenda. Again, for people familiar with the history of the service, that wouldn't be surprising. There was a real push to get greater responsiveness through the 90s and early 2000s. There's a strong commitment to consultation, but I will note here that that's consultation processes. There's a difference between being committed to consulting and the people you consult with feeling that it's a meaningful exercise. So that little theme started to come out a bit. In terms of some areas for improvement, again, not rocket science, there's been an upward elevation of responsibility for decision making. That sits across a number of different sub-elements. But basically, we've also had change management capability, more effective strategic risk management, strategic business planning, workforce planning, and staff management as areas that we've got clear uh, to improve in. Last slide. Ultimately, this is a change management process. 
you want to improve how people can perform within organizations, you've got to bring them with you. There's a clear mandate from government which is incurring agencies to do this. It's not optional. Departmental secretaries have embraced these reviews and are actually leading the process. They're seeing it as a way to set the direction for the department and move the department there. The senior review teams bring fresh perspectives. The review methodology itself engages and supports staff involvement. We've had consistent feedback that they enjoy the workshops. They feel that they're actually getting to say things. It really flushes out the elephants in the room. You can't hide it. Multiple workshops, multiple interviews, something will come up somewhere. The independent findings actually are setting out practical areas for action and leaving agencies able and willing to move forward with that action. The extent they do it will be determined looking over the next two years. And lastly, this process itself begins the process of improving internal capability. You're getting people collectively across the organisation to think about what it needs to do, where it needs to be, how it needs to communicate that to its own staff and how to make sure it's meaningful for stakeholders. So thank you very much. Uh, at the moment, but there is, CAC agencies are included within the perspective of the relevant portfolio agency. So for example, with the Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries, there was some consideration of the research development corporations as being within the suite. There isn't any one defined approach. If a particular agency felt it was important to go out to CAC agencies or even delivery partners, then that's something the review team does. We're starting to, because it is a, the reviews don't all run in parallel, it's sequential. What we're trying to do is bring all of the agencies together that have either completed reviews and are doing action plans or are going to be doing action plans or are going to be doing reviews. We've had two whole of service meetings, get them in a room, get them to talk about what's worked, get them to talk about what they need, see if you can bring the two together. And if you can't, go and look externally and see if there's a service provider in the market that has got one solution that all the agencies can use. That's not part of our fee-for-service model, but it's the real benefit you drive off this program. And what you get from that perspective is things that have been tested and worked. They're not always transferable, but it's a jolly good place to start and it's a very sensible suggestion. Anyone else? Yes, please. Yeah, how do you find this uh, working at um, addressing the issue of um, passive resistance in the management? Uh, again, that, that is something that we've tried to address through the methodology. We go right down to EL2s, EL1s, APS 6s and 5s. So we segment through the interviews and the workshops where we go and talk to people. We ha start off with the secretary and the deputy secretaries, then we typically go to FASAs, SES. Uh, and what you find is that you bring out from those different segments different views. They then get tabled back in the review. And rather than, rather than just jumping to conclusions, we actually run things called validation workshops, where the senior reviewers who are quite heavy hitters, they're used to handling, uh, how would you say it? Uh, r yes, r robust, robust and uh, somewhat uh, slow enthusiasm towards a change process. They simply go back, they bring all the BAM 2s and the BAM 1s into a room and they test the hypotheses for them. Not everyone will agree with every finding. It is an independent report, but what you want is a clear logic. We also bring in independent uh, data points from the state of the service census. We take agency snapshots. So if, the, if any layer of management, right down to EL1, had a particular view, we could take a sample of their view, 60% think X, if then the whole of agency data shows that all the other cohorts, 10% would agree with that, you have something for conversation. But the real point is to engage with them, make sure they've had a chance to say what it is they would agree or disagree with, and then note that their view is valid. It's just that if they really feel their view is the view that the organization has to follow, and that aligns with other executive. <coughs> exactly. If that's still the direction you want to go in, what you're getting is a story here that you've got to bring the organization with you. So because it's got multiple entry points, it removes a bit of that sense of it being one segment overriding all other segments. And as you've noted, the messaging is very important. Please. How do you do your selection mechanisms for these new workshops? Because mm. 
to, to a point, uh, over time we've become more and more focused on the original engagement with the agency, because the more the agency sees this as an actually an opportunity, and they, they really are now. They want to own the process, they want to own what comes out of the report, because they're going to be accountable for two years for delivering it. Uh, that also means that they want to get to the heart of what the agency thinks. As an example, new secretaries who've been recently in a department have found this a very useful process. We, don't, we consult with the agency on how we do scheduling and interviews and workshops, and we try and make sure we come to an agreement with them, but ultimately if the senior review team feels very strongly that it wants to do a particular segment, or it, it's concerned that uh, an interview with a group of people may not be representative, we can schedule another one. Uh, agencies have also recognised, because of this messaging point, for example, not everyone is a policy agency in Canberra were full of EL2s and EL1s. Some other agencies have APS6s with substantive staff responsibilities. And there the senior review teams are going out to regional operations, meeting with these people and talking with them. So it is a risk. It's more of a risk the bigger the agency. But that's why we try when we're doing the scheduling never to just have one sample. We try and make sure we have as far as is possible based on the cost of doing this different entry points. It doesn't help the agency if they get a skewed response. It's going to make it harder to implement the priorities that, they, that come out of the review. So there is a, there's a sampling risk. We try and manage it. Yeah. And I mean, I'm one, one from one of the agencies that you've been reviewing. Would love to have been part mm. of this process. As would I have. I wasn't involved in it in my, the agency <laughs> before I took up this role. Yeah. And I, I would be... A, I was concerned looking back that there was selective sampling of yeah. people, but I, the message we're giving now is that really doesn't help the agency. Mm -hmm. uh, and agencies are increasingly realise that if they have some sense of where they want to go, they can actually use this to, to, to do a course check and then make sure that their staff understand and are prepared to go with them. If you don't, then it becomes a different approach, but it's why the independent senior review team and the seniority of the senior review team is so important. Yes, please. Do you try and get empirical data to assess whether your programs are effective or not? Just pick a simple proxy, you know, changes in levels of sick leave. Yes, we do. Do you go for those types of things? We use the APSI data, which looks at staff retention rates and turnover rates in agencies. We ask agencies, the first phase of a review is called pre field work, and that involves an APSC team going in for five weeks. We ask in advance for uh, key documents to be supplied to us, something between 50 and 100. We will analyse the documents, we will do initial workshops, we will do initial interviews to try and come to a position before the senior reviewers hit the ground. That's not saying we have recommendations, just we have some high-level hypotheses for them to run with. So if there's any data that's within the agency, we ask for it. If agencies have done external stakeholder surveys, we bring them in. If there are maturity models around risk or P3, M3 or gateway, we bring it in. If previous reviews have been used, we bring it in. All that data is pulled together by my teams and then given as a starting point to the senior review team. Uh, we also try and consult as widely as possible with stakeholders. That is a trade-off between what the agency wants and what the senior review team wants. But as what we're also seeing now is agencies are increasingly thinking of the fact they need baselines in place to be able to demonstrate progress. Uh, so if you move from a first round of reviews to a second round of reviews, one would expect much stronger baselines in place. But if there's a data source, we bring it in if we can get our hands on it. Well, what's going to happen if we get significant mod change? Cabinet, Cabinet decided that any mogged agency comes into scope. One has to be practical. Uh, if it's a small mog, you might adjust the forward schedule, you might skip a health check and go to a second review. Should, should in September whoever uh, ends up with a new administration decide they want the program to continue? If there's a significant MOG change, well, it's in scope. Uh, we have two at the moment, the Department of Climate Change, Industry, Innovation, Science, Research, Tertiary Education and resources, energy and tourism. In both of those instances, we, we have some climate change functions coming in, but if you think about it, um, some people have been, it's a good question, some people have asked it a lot, uh, I'm thinking of one particular officer, surely that agency wants to think about how to integrate its functions to be able to be functioning effectively in 18 months, and you have another department like regional, which has come together 18 months ago, a capability review can be a great road check for how it's going, as long as 
ourselves, the service external commentators, recognize not every agency is going to go straight to the best rating, the strongest rating. If you've pulled together a, whole, a heap of very difficult functions, you've complex ICT systems to bring together, and you get a development area or well-placed in 18 months, that's not a bad result. So it's where the context here is, is very important. But yeah, I mean, MOG happens, MOG's going to continue to happen, and ultimately organisational capability has to be able to cope with it, so it definitely is in scope. Nowadays, look, we, none of us, private sector or public sector, get a lot of time anymore, so I'm not saying that there aren't challenges with MOG, but once administrative arrangements change, an agency needs to be thinking about what does this mean in terms of our staff profile, how do we communicate what we do well to our stakeholders, if, if they still see us having a particular position, are our new messages, our strategic plans, is that making sense? These are all things that will demonstrate good leadership, effective strategy, and then over time, we should see good delivery. Theoretically, I mean, it's not easy, but you know, MOG, MOG isn't gonna stop, so that would be where I'd start with this one. Yeah, anyone else? There is a little bit of stuff on the website, uh, on the APSC, if you're interested. Four reports are in the public domain. Another series of reports will be released in November this year, probably nine or 10. Uh, we release them once a year with the State of the Service report because the whole suite of reports is considered together to inform what we say about the service. But if anyone's interested, there are four on the web. They're in the public domain. Prime Minister and Cabinet, Infrastructure and Transport, Immigration and Australian Citizenship and Human Services, I believe, if I've got it right. Yep. Thank you.